You need to embrace capitalism. It is this hope which is the lever of progress. My favorite Fed. To keep one's reactions warm and true. And they attack us because we're over there. Is to have found the secret of perpetual youth. Man, you're too pretty to be a libertarian. And perpetual youth is, is salvation. What's up, guys? You're listening to a boy named that's Mr. Suit You. Welcome to the show. I got a great show for you today. I invited the great Sheldon Richmond on. Sheldon is quite an eclectic writer. He's one of the greatest minds I have ever spoken to in my short over two decades lifespan. And he wrote a fabulous book published at the Libertarian Institute where you can pick it up just in time for the holidays, for Christmas, for Hanukkah, for Kwanzaa, for Festivus, or just a gift for a loved one, a friend, whatever. But it's called Coming to Palestine, and him and I unveil some info that a lot of people don't know, and if they think they know, frankly, they've been lied to from the mainstream media, from just being indoctrinated with with lies. So I'm glad you made it today. I encourage you to go pick up this book. Again, it's called Coming to Palestine. You can pick it up on Amazon or at the Libertarian Institute. And you can also go check out some of the great books that the Institute has put out as recent. Um, you got the uh, ravings of William Norman Grigg. The late William Norman Grigg. You have Scott Horton's The Great Ron Paul. Every single archived interview of him and Ron Paul on the Scott Horton show. And it's all archived in a script format. Super great. You're going to love it. I know you will. Believe me. I, I, you're, it's, it's Scott Horton and Ron Paul. Like, duh. You're going to love it. And we have also got, of course... Fool's errand. Time to end the war in Afghanistan. And dag nabbit. It's uh it's well overdue. But what's also overdue is Scott's next book. So if you want to help him out get it faster, do him and everyone at the Institute a favor and uh use those free market muscles and buy some great literature. So uh yeah. And I Sheldon, I just can't thank you enough, sir. It was great meeting you finally, and yeah, I think I've I've, I've said enough. So, I'm Mr. Sue at Mr. Sue, aka Phil Gibson, editor at the Li- Libertarian Institute. You want to send some stuff over to me to publish? If you think your writing is fantabulous and you just want to spread your liberty literature across the lands from sea to shining sea in a non-empire tyrannical way, then go ahead and shoot me an email at pgibbs, um, pgibbs at pgibbs.io. Again, that's pgibbs at pgibbs.io. I'll take a look at it. I'm sure it's going to be great. And I'll throw it up there, and your work will be at the Libertarian Institute as a featured article. And if that doesn't tickle your fancy, then you need to see a doctor. I just hope your copay isn't as expensive as mine. So, without any further delay, here's my conversation with the great Sheldon Richmond. Uh, fair warning, the microphone he was using, I guess, gets caught in his marvelous, marvelous beard. Um a bit midway through. It doesn't sound bad. I just want to be transparent with you guys. And, uh, yeah, time to cut cut the crap and really just soak up all this information from this interview. I ask all the right questions I feel like. Try to make it uh, a little different than some of the other appearances that he's been on. But, um, yeah. And also, go uh, peruse Sheldon's work at the Libertarian Institute. 
because he's written the book on homeschooling, guns, the Constitution. He is a libertarian to, not the T, the L. I want to say the L. Um, he is Mr. Libertarian, if there is one. And I think he's just a modern-day wizard because he's, he's amazing. Anyway, here's me and Sheldon talking about Enjoy. Sheldon Richmond, thank you, sir, for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Well, and thank you for inviting me. Glad to be with you. Awesome. Yeah, happy to have you here. And we are here today to talk about your book, Coming to Palestine. And it is a collection of articles over 30 years. Is that right? That's right. I started writing about this issue in the late 80s. Uh, and wrote about it continuously into the uh, into the 90s, and then a little bit past that. And then actually, there's a gap where I was, oh, focus was more uh, on domestic matters, and so I wasn't uh, writing about uh, foreign very much, and and not the Middle East. Uh, just given the nature of my work, I was editor of the Freeman for 15 years in that period, which is pretty much domestic economics, uh, civil liberties maybe too, but. It's, the thrust of it is economic and domestic. So I wasn't, uh, uh, I didn't have, a, my focus wasn't on that. And so there's a gap. And then I returned to it really in the last couple of years. So uh, I say over, it took 30 years to write the book, but uh, not continuously for 30 years. Yeah. Well, you need a little break from just reading about the soul sucking trauma of, you know, the uh, victimized Palestinians. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a tragic story. It actually drains me. So, so maybe that was part of my reason, too. Uh, I also never wanted to be a one-issue person. If you look back over what I've written about, I'm all over the place. I always like being a generalist. And you so, are. Which is also a burden, because then you want to keep up with sort of everything. You feel like, okay, i got to know about that. i got to know about that. Uh, so... Uh, one issue being one issue has has its uh, has its benefits, but also has its drawbacks. Yeah, I mean, knowledge is power. It's amazing how much I've really learned being in the, the this you know liberty <laughs> circle. I mean, you just learn so many different topics. I mean, you have foreign policy, you have economics, and it goes across the board. And you mm-hmm. know, it's amazing a difference. You know, just simply six months to a year can can really make and change your perspective. But mm-hmm. um, but I want to talk about just kind of first approach like the 30,000 foot perspective on kind of what the main issue is that you're trying to cover. And I, I kind of want to sum it up and then start from the beginning because there's a lot of history to cover. I think a good place yeah. w- would be actually to start with Sykes-Pico and kind of how that has affected U.S. foreign policy since then. Um, but the, the issue at hand is that the mainstream narrative is that there is uh, Israel and uh, the Israeli Jews there feel like they have a claim to the entire land and, you know, the Palestinians that were there, well, they like to argue that they weren't there really in the first place. And because of the Old Testament, I guess, it's their land forever. Now, whether or not they just kind of use religion as political expedience and are really more secular than we think, that's kind of another discussion maybe we can get into. But um, the, you, your, your articles, your book kind of debunks this narrative. Um, and there's a lot to it, but I think a good place, even before Sex Pico, is I, I kind of really want to understand that there were Jews that were in Israel at some point, and... I mean, did they or or did they not get run out from like the Roman Empire? <laughs> well, that that you actually started at a very good point. Most people wouldn't start there. Um, so, the two things to say about that. Uh, the first, I mean, I don't take the the Bible as a history book, and for a very long time, Jewish intellectuals did not regard the the Bible as a history book. For the folks back in Sheldon Richmond is uh, of Jewish descent. Exactly. And I discussed that in my book. People can see that. Uh, and how the first criticism of Israel I ever heard came from my Orthodox Jewish uh, grandfather, who was from the old country, as we say. But let's get back to your question here. Uh, 
So I, I, I'm dismissing the Bible as a, as a book of history. And Jewish historians, Jewish intellectuals, until into the 19th century, did not regard the Bible as history. So you asked about that the Romans kicked the, the Hebrews out, the Judeans, I think they were actually called. The word Jew was beginning to be used at, at that point. Because the kingdom was at that point known as Judea. Uh, did uh, The story is that the Romans, uh, there was an uprising against the Romans. And in 70 uh, of the uh, common era, or 70 AD, as Christians would put it, uh, the Romans exile the all, you know all the Judeans to, uh, to Rome, I guess, and then from there they scatter, and that's where we get the wandering Jew, the diaspora, uh, which then, according to the narrative, which I'm challenging, uh, you know, the diaspora then was able to go home beginning in 1948 with the founding of the modern state of Israel. Uh, well. There's no basis to that story whatsoever. Uh, and, and one of the things that, uh, a book that I'm very uh, big on that I discuss in my book, Shlomo Sand has a book called The Invention of the Jewish People. And, and he will be the first to tell you he didn't come up with anything new. He puts it together maybe for a new presentation, but he's drawing on historians who go back many, many years, and you can see it in the book. There was no exile in, in the year 70 the first century of the common area. There was no exile by the Romans. And no, there's no book about an exile. So, so the Jews didn't get kicked out. But here's the, so we can go from there and discuss the implications. They're very, very interesting. But I need to add something very, very quickly. Let's assume the Romans did kick the Jews out the Hebrews out, the Judeans, whatever one of the Israelites, kicked them out in 70. Let's say for the sake of argument, they did all get thrown out, first to Rome, and then they scattered from there to Europe and elsewhere. That would not justify the founding of Israel in 1948, the return, because you can't, look, 2,000 years later, you can't show up someplace and say, my ancestor used once lived here, so leave, I'm back. You can't do that. Think about the chaos in the world if you did that everywhere. Uh, it just makes no sense. So even if the the narrative is right as far as uh, what the Romans did uh, is right, it doesn't get you where you want to go. On top of that, though, that story is not true. There were always the Judeans there. You know, look, there couldn't have been an exile in 70 because in 132 – there's a major Jewish uprising against the Romans. Bar Kokhba, the famous Bar Kokhba rebellion. He was the great general. Who, who was he leading? He thought he was leading a Jewish rebellion. Did nobody tell him? Did he not get the memo that all Jews were kicked out 60 years earlier? Who did he lead? Who did he lead on the fight? What did he get actors or something? Uh, and then there was, and then when the Arabs showed up in the in the uh, what is it, seventh century, they showed up in Palestine. They, they, there were Jews there then. In fact, they actually welcomed the Muslims because they thought they had a better shot with the Muslims than they had with the Christians. And they did, actually. They lived pretty well with the Muslims. So there's no exile, which means there's no diaspora. Now, that's going to lead to the question, well, who are all the Jews in Europe? Where are all, where are all the Ashkenazi Jews come from? That is one of my also, questions. And also the Jews in the Arab world. You know, there was Jews in Iraq and and Yemen, there, there are Jews in Yemen, there are Jews in Iran. There's an old Jewish community in Iran, uh, and there are Jews in, there were Jews in Spain. They got thrown out in 1492, but there were Jews in Spain and Portugal. Where, where those Jews come from? There were no exile. And Sand documents the answer to this. And again, he's not the first to say this. You can sum it up in one word, conversion. The, the Judy, Jewish religion, see, we don't know this today. And I never learned this growing up. Uh, Judaism today doesn't encourage, and had in the 20th century, you know, late 19th century, did not encourage conversion. It made it very difficult. So Judaism has a reputation for not being a proselytizing religion. But that wasn't always true. From the, the time of the Maccabees, in like the last 200 years of BCE, before the Common Era, or BC as, again, the Christians say, and for a couple hundred years after, into the Common Era, the Jewish religion was a very proselytizing missionary religion, and it converted many tribes and kingdoms all around the Mediterranean, and, the, and then beyond the Mediterranean into the uh, Caucasus, south of Russia, 
north of, say, where the Republic of Georgia is between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. It's known as the Empire, the Khazar Empire. It, the king converted to Judaism and, and all his subjects beca became Jews. And they then moved west when there was a Mongol invasion, you know, in the 11th, 12th century, somewhere in their 13th century. And they moved west and became the Ash they're the Ashkenazi Jews. So you don't need an exile to explain the, ex the explosion and the, uh, and the growth of the Jewish population in Europe. Again, this is interesting history, but it really doesn't bear on the political issue. And, you know, you said what was like the 30,000 foot view of the issue. And to, just to give you that answer quickly, my book shows, and again, I'm not the first, I draw, I'm drawing together lots of people who have been writing for decades and decades since the Zionist movement began in the late 19th century. But my book shows that the mainstream narrative is com almost completely upside down. So if you flip it over, you're going to be much, you're going to have a much uh, story much closer to the truth than the uh, traditional narrative. By which I mean, the Palestinians are the aggrieved party. I, the, if you just go by what the U.S. media tells you and what you kind of just absorb from the culture in the U.S., whether you come from a Jewish family or not, or not, you're going to have a sense that the Israelis, the Jewish Israelis, are the aggrieved party, and the aggressor is the Palestinians. And it's just not true. The people that came to Palestine beginning in the late 19th century and then into the 20th century and then 1947, 48, where things really pick up, those were European, you know, atheists for the most part, secular, you suggested secular. Yes, they mostly were secular, the founders, and for a long time it was run, well, it's almost still run today basically by secularists. Um, they came having no, no links except, except what they would claim spiritual, except they weren't religious, spiritual links to, uh, to, to, to the, what we call the whole, what some people call the Holy Land, Canaan, the old biblical Canaan. And what they did was uh, they started moving in and throwing uh, Palestinians off land. They, they didn't buy the land. They bought like 7% of, of, of all the land by, by 1948. Uh, much of it they got by driving people off land, some massacres, and then there was and, and war and, uh, and conquest. And then they did it again in 67 when, they, when the occupied territories come into the possession of Israel. So um, just to build up on that a little bit, and I think this might be one of our favorite, <clears throat> excuse me, favorite parts of this discussion is we get to blame Woodrow Wilson for everything, as Rothbardians <laughs> do. But... Um, yeah, he wasn't uh, like the one of the main heads behind Sykes Pico. Those mainly the British and the French at first, but basically discuss that and discuss how that has, of course, inflicted the Israel and Palestinian conflict. Right. But also, um, if we can somehow tie that in um, with really figuring out, we cover this: who these white European, um, you know, convert Jews were who were claiming exile from post-Nazi Germany. Yeah. Um, but what did the logistics also look like? And why didn't they just go to New York City after the Holocaust? Like, why, why Israel? Well, uh, okay. That was kind yeah. of a lot. At one There's a lot to, packed in there. Let me make one more point that's sort of uh, to close off what I was saying before, uh, a point I should have made. Surely. Uh, who are the Palestinians? Given my story, no exile. And, you know, most of the Jews in the world are descendants of converts, that would include me. Uh, and I consider myself a former Jew because I'm not, I'm not religious and I don't know what a secular Jew is. We can, argue, we can discuss that too. You can, you can get a lot of argument out of it. But that leads to the question, who are the Palestinians then? Well, guess what? David Ben-Gurion, who was, became the first prime minister, one of the early Zionist uh, pioneers, and became the first prime minister in 48. And Yitzhak Ben Zvi, who became the second president of Israel uh, in 19, whenever Chaim Weitzman died, who was the first president, uh, they wrote a book in 1918. And Ben Zvi uh, was a historian. Uh, uh, ben Gurion wasn't, but Ben Zvi was a historian. So the, 
the, he brought his, you know, the historian skills to this book. They published the book in 1918 in Hebrew and then in Yiddish, arguing that the Palestinians are the descendants of the Judeans and even the Canaanites. Well, because that's the population that's been there continuously. Now, lots of people have come, came through over the centuries because that was a crossroads, right? Palestine was a crossroads. Eastern Mediterranean, uh, you know, below uh, Syria, uh, lots of populations, lots of groups, traders and whatnot, including armies, came, came through. And people then sort of hang around and uh, they get together with the, with the in, indigenous people and they marry or they have kids. And so it's a, you know, it's a mixed pop, it's a population of mixed descent. But there's certainly a very plausible case that the, Tate, the, the Palestinians have their roots in Canaan, even before there was the founding of the original ancient kingdoms of, uh, of Israel and, uh, and Judah back, you know, King David, we're talking about King David, King Solomon, we're going all the way back. Those are the people, and Ben-Gurion was convinced of this, and he wasn't the only one. Zionist historians in the early days, in the 19th century and early 20th century, said these people are our brethren. Now, when the Zionists when, sorry, when the Palestinians began to resist the, uh, being thrown off land, imagine that. They didn't like getting thrown off the land. But in the 20s, when they started resisting, now suddenly the story changed, and those books got put down the memory hole. Now they weren't going to be talked about. Zionists weren't going to talk about them as being brethren because they weren't happy about the Zionists coming to, to live there and take over the place and transfer the Palestinians out. Anyway, now, to get to your... Your question, <laughs> your real question, which I might have forgotten. Run a quick. Oh no, we were like right there. So in the in the twenties, okay. a little bit. Oh yeah. Sykes Pico. Okay, the Sykes Pico. Yeah. So okay, World War One. We got World War One coming along. Now, what's World War One? World War One is European war. The U.S. gets into it kind of late. The first half of 19, World War Two. Nineteen seventeen. Yeah. Hmm. Act One of the great of the of the World War of the twentieth century. You're right. Uh, but in so the U.S. doesn't get it until 1917. The war begins in 1914. So there's a lot of stuff going on before the U.S. gets in. And the British and the French and the Russians before the Russian Revolution, the Czar make uh, their their foreign ministers make a separate or their diplomats make a, make a secret agreement, which is known as Sykes Pico. Sykes being Mark Sykes from uh, uh, England and Pico George Pico. I forget his name. Uh, and I guess the, for some reason the Russian didn't get any billing, <laughs> but they, they do the secret. They do the secret agreement. But before I tell you about the secret agreement, which is not so secret anymore, you can find it on the Wikipedia. Uh, the British went to everybody's heard of Lawrence of Arabia. Maybe you've even seen the movie from the '60s, great movie. The British go to the one of the the prominent Arab family there, the the house of uh, Saud. You know that word from Saudi Arabia. It's a very prominent uh, family. A couple, there are rival families for leadership of the Arab world, but that was one of the biggies. And they go, the British go to to him, the head of that family. They send Lawrence, who was interested in the Arab world, famous T. E. Lawrence, Thomas Edward Lawrence, and they cut a deal. They say, "Here's the deal: the Ottoman Empire was an ally of Germany and Austria-Hungary in World War One." Okay, the war's already going on. So the Ottoman Empire, which was Turkey, which was a much bigger Turkey in those days and included control of the Middle East, uh, Palestine, that whole area, the Levant, we call it. Uh, they go to the uh, Arabs and say, if you sabotage the Ottoman Empire's war effort, which would hurt the Germans, because Britain, it wasn't a sure thing that Britain and the Allies were going to win that war. The Germans would give them a run for their money. They're not really so the British you, Empire anymore at this point. It's still an empire. I mean, they have, they have India. They're going to have India until 48. They have That's Egypt. true. They, have good, they get part of Egypt. I think they, don't, they have full control of Egypt. Suez Canal, I think, by then. Yeah, they, by then. They get, they Apologies. Have, go ahead. Sorry. So there, it's, it, no, the empire is, uh, Churchill's still, you know, he hasn't even hit his stride yet. <laughs> He's like colonial uh, secretary or something like that. Uh, or, yeah, I think or First Lord of the Amity, he had a lot of jobs. Anyway, they go to the Arabs and say, you sabotage the Turks, the Ottomans, and we'll reward you when we win this war with independence. Uh, the Arabs, I'm not sure they really trusted the uh, British, but they had uh, 
they it was they might as well roll the dice. So because they weren't getting it from the Turks. Uh, meanwhile, the British cut a deal with France and the Tsar, saying that when we win the war, here's how we're going to carve up the Middle East. So in other words, they tell the Arabs, "Yeah, you help us, you'll be independent." Meanwhile, they're saying to themselves. Here's going to, this is going to be your sphere of influence. This is going to be your sphere of influence. And this is, this is going to be our sphere of influence. Carving up the very land that they promised the Arabs they'd have independence over. So they lie. Meanwhile, 1917, they issue the Balfour Declaration. Lord Balfour was the uh, what, foreign secretary. Uh, he issues this uh, 17, uh, it's not 17 words, it's longer than that, but it's a very short letter that says, that his majesty's government looks on, by the way, it was written by Chaim Weizmann and the Zionists. There was a lot of interaction with the British, the Zionists were very active in Britain. It's like a pre-clean break. <laughs> right. The, it, what it said was his majesty's government, it was King, whoever the King was. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't Edward, it was somebody else by then. One of the Georges probably. Uh, the, His Majesty's government looks with favor, this is almost a direct quote, looks with favor upon, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the setting up a, Jew, a Jewish national home in Palestine. This was very carefully chosen language. They used the word state. The Zionist movement had a state in mind, a political entity. But they came up with this very vague term, the Jewish national home in Palestine. And then it quickly added, it being understood that nothing about that, though, will prejudice the rights of the non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the Jewish communities everywhere else in the world. Oh, good. Uh, now, it's funny how they refer to the non-Jewish communities. The, the Jews in, in 1917 were a very tiny percentage of the population of Palestine, and yet the, the overwhelming majority are just referred to as the, non, the non-Jewish community. I mean, it's kind of a weird thing anyway. Anyway, this is seen... And it's celebrated to this day. Balfour, the Balfour uh, holiday is a, is a holiday in Israel, and they, they observe it in uh, in Britain. They just did it uh, back in, uh, I forget what it was, no, I forget what month it occurs in. But uh, uh, it's a big deal because it's considered the, you know, the day really that Israel was born, even though it didn't officially, uh, you know, get created or create itself in 1948. But it's considered the, you know, the key, the key uh, moment when, uh, uh, by the way, keep in mind, England didn't yet control Palestine. It hadn't won the war yet. <laughs> the Turkish uh, Turkish Empire, Ottoman Empire, was still in charge. So here it was. It's it trading, it. but with geography. It wasn't theirs to give. Even in a colonial sense, it wasn't theirs to give. It didn't have it yet. They just assumed they'd win the war. Uh, but it was probably helpful in getting America into the war because the the the, the, Jew, the Jewish uh, Jewish Americans who were who were Zionists was a minority who were Zionists would have said, Oh, great. Okay. Let's, we can help. Let's help the British win this war. Cause a lot of, a lot of American Jews are, were German and were actually sympathetic to Germany in, in, in the first world war because it was their former home. And they had, they had, they, they still felt, uh, you know, some, some uh, had good feelings toward, toward Germany, but this might have uh, p- pushed the, uh, pushed them over and said, well, now Britain has promised, to help create a national home in Palestine, so let's hope Britain wins the war. I'm not saying the, the the Jewish influence in the U.S. was decisive. I don't think they were that powerful to to get Wilson. Wilson wanted to get in the war anyway. He didn't need a push from uh, from Jews. Uh, so anyway, that's how things get going there. And Britain, of course, Britain and France do win the war with the with, well, the U.S. make sure they win the war by getting in the uh, in 1917. And the the British and the French basically take over Palestine and Syria and Iraq. France gets Syria, and then they carve out Lebanon as a separate country, and uh, England, England gets Iraq to run as colonies. And then uh, Palestine, the area we call Palestine now, or Israel, Palestine, uh, became a uh, uh, under the League of Nations became a mandate, which is just really a colony for England. Because uh, it had language about how you know England's just overseeing it until until uh, the people there are capable of self-government. You know, typical paternalistic nonsense that, <laughs> that colonial powers in those days like to uh, to uh, to speak uh, when they uh, were talking about their colon- colonial possessions. 
Anyway, that's that we just up. call it democracy and infringement on democracy. Right. The sort the the area that became Saudi Arabia was pretty much left to itself because they didn't know about the oil at, at that point. So they they let the family, the Saudi government, kind of, uh, uh, you know, it was still a sphere of influence for for the British, but they they had more control, self control than uh, Palestine. Uh, they also created Jordan in those days. It was Trans Jordan because it was the other side of the Jordan River uh, from Palestine, and so uh, that's where that's where Britain and France that's where their interests lie. Not in not in the big peninsula the arabian peninsula that would change though once they discover that there's a lot of oil there <laughs> right anyway i think I, I think i maybe answered all your questions <laughs> yeah i i would say so i mean just I mean, you're cutting up a bunch of land that people have been living there for centuries yeah. already but when it comes to actually the jews that are i guess escaping exile after nazi germany okay what what do the logistics actually look like with the makba or really catastrophe I mean, where, did they use a bunch of like weapons to basically, you know, displace and genocide all these Palestinians? I mean, I don't think the U.S. was kind of, you know, backing them mil- militarily by then. No. How did all? Uh, what were the? How'd that work out? This is your friendly reminder to rate, subscribe, review. They say the best things they come in threes, like rate, subscribe, review. If you rate it five stars, we can raise the bar. Subscribe so you can stay in tune. And don't forget at the very end to leave a nice review. Something like I love you, Sue. Rate, subscribe, review, please. Thank you. Well, they were getting weapons informally from Americans, from American Jews. Money, uh, money and, 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 and guns were being funneled. There was quite a major effort. But let's talk about, you mentioned the yeah, Nazi Germany, which is, of course, very important. Uh, and then of course, all, the, Jew, the Jews oh, have had... Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. I was going to um, say, yeah. the history of, of the Jews in Europe is not a ha- very happy history, even, even up to 30, 1933 when Hitler becomes chancellor. Let's, let's, let's not look at that yet. It's a very unhappy history. There were is pogroms, right? There's uh, the Russian, the Polish Empire uh, emptying out of the of uh, villages by edict. Uh, very bad time. Uh, in contrast, uh, Jews did much better in the Muslim world. Uh, when the Muslims were in control of Spain, there were there were uh, cities where Christians, uh, Jews, and Muslims lived very well together, and very famous Jews. Uh, flourish there for a while, but even when they had to leave, like to take Moses Maimonides, who's the you know the great uh, medieval Jewish philosopher, theologian, uh, very famous, who was in I guess Cordoba, which was one of those very tolerant cities for a long time, where uh, when the Muslims controlled the Iberian Peninsula, but there were Christians and Jews there living fine. But then when a when a different uh, ruler came in and it, there was a, a more less tolerant strain uh, in uh, in uh, in that time, we're talking about like what, 10th century, something like that, 11th century, somewhere in there. Uh, when Maimonides has to leave because it's not it's not the tolerant place it used to be, he doesn't go to Palestine. He st- I think he stops in Palestine, but where he ends up is Cairo, where he writes his great books and he writes them in Arabic. And he's also the doctor, the physician to uh, Saladin, the famous uh, ruler there. Um, so he doesn't go to Palestine. He goes to to Cairo. Uh, so Jew, Jews got along pretty well. I'm not saying it was perfect, but nothing's perfect uh, with, with the Muslims. And certainly if you compare it side by side to the, to the time that the Jews had in Europe, in Christian Europe, the Muslim world was the, the darn good. And the Jews understood that back then. Now, we get to, we get to Nazi Germany, horrible act of, you know, mechanized genocide you know, in, in, to, in a scale the world's never seen. Uh, I, I, absolute horror. Um, one thing that happened as a result of Nazi Germany is that the, the, the face of Zionism changes to a, to a humanitarian refugee project, right? You have these displaced people, the survivors have need a place to go. 
where should they go? The answer was Israel, Palestine, which they wanted to create Israel you know, out of. This was the Zionist movement. But it's very important to understand that it that's not the face of Zionism before Nazi Germany. It was not a refugee project. The idea that Herzl, Theodor Herzl had in mind when he puts together a Zionist organization, it wasn't the first out of the idea. In fact, it's actually a non-Jewish idea from the middle of the 19th century, a British idea from non-Jews who said, hey, I got an idea. Let's send off all the Jews to Palestine. And uh, that way, uh, you know, Jesus will return. It'll be end, you know, end times and all that stuff. Uh, most Jews were thought the idea was nuts. They wanted nothing to do with it. When Herzl sets up the Zionist organization, uh, they're saying, you're crazy. We, for number one, we don't want to go to Palestine. Number two, there are people already in Palestine. Number three, we're citizens. These were Americans talking, Germans, others, British. We're already settled in our countries. We're citizens of those countries. If you set up a state, that's going to cast a bad light on us. People are going to wonder, well, come on, what's your, what's your state? Palestine, Israel, or uh, is it uh, where you're living now? And they didn't want that pressure. Uh, Herzl was willing to go someplace else other than Palestine. He wasn't even committed to Palestine, but the people around him, you know, said, no, it's got to it's gotta be Palestine. Uh, so anyway, the point was, it's not, it, the point is that it was not a refugee project. It was, the idea was all Jews were supposed to move there because, because Herzl wanted to create, and he put it this way, he wanted to create the new Jew instead of the Jew that just uh, is in banking and, you know, uh, and, uh, or, or, or bending over the holy books all day, you know, with the long beards. He wanted to shake off that image and, and have a new image of a farmer and soldier, you know, strong man, strong men and women. Uh, and, uh, and, and then the, the other side to pick this up, and they wanted to do, Palestine was not going to be the place because that was ancient Israel. And, uh, and, and that was the idea. Jews were supposed to move there. It was only after Nazi Germany that it became then a place that it was presented. The, the mission didn't change, but the, but the presentation changed. Now it was a place for the poor, you know, wretched survivors to go. And why did they need to go there? Because... Britain had closed its doors in 1905, and the United States had closed its doors in 1924 with an anti-immigration bill that signed signed by Calvin Coolidge, who, for some reason, some some libertarians think was a great president. Uh, they shut out people from Eastern Europe, and the British had done it earlier. Uh, instead of liberals getting together, I mean, I'm talking about radical liberals, libertarians. Uh, all getting together even before Hitler came along and saying, open up the gates. So this, this persecuted people who's, who are always in danger in Europe have a place to go. Uh, the Zionist organization wasn't interested in having another place to go. They wanted only one place to go, Palestine. Because if, if you could get to England or Canada or the U.S. or, or uh, South Africa or someplace else, Argentina or some uh, Jews did go to get away from Europe, if they, could, if they could freely go to those places, that would take all the pressure off for the statehood movement in Palestine. So the Zionist movement was not interested in finding other places for the Jews to go. They might have saved a lot of Jews from, from Hitler, uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, so Europe felt very guilty after what happened in Germany. And I guess you know a lot of U.S. Uh, policymakers felt guilty too. And so they were, they were behind the, uh, the project, the Zionist project now for Israel. Except when the, you know, when the Arabs started really resisting this, the Palestinians started resisting it, then, then Britain started to pull back a little bit and you know, uh, restrict immigration into, into Palestine by, uh, by Jews from Europe. And uh, you know, it becomes real messy because it, Britain is being subjected now to resistance both from the Zionists, because they had guns and they had bombs, and they did, they engaged in terrorism, and also from uh, Palestinian Arabs who were upset that they were their land their home was being taken from them. So you get a real mess, and then England finally says in 1947, the UN has now been set up after World War II. England, is, uh, Britain, is uh, washes his hands of it. Right, he throws the issue to the UN and says, "We're getting out. 
we can't take it anymore. We want out. Now we're getting the crumbling of the British Empire because they're losing uh, India and the other places. Uh, dis despite uh, Churchill's uh, intention, uh, he, he did preside over the dissolution of the British Empire. So where, anyway, that, no, the, that UN, was... the, the UN then recommends partition. Uh, recommends partition. UN had no power to partition Palestine. It recommended partitioning to an Arab state and a Jewish state, uh, even though the, uh, Jew, the Jews were like a third of the population and owned 7% uh, of the land. Uh, and, and Britain, you know, left and let that happen. And then Israel declared independence. And, uh, and then uh, some of the Arab governments tried to fight, fight Israel. Meanwhile, the, the, you asked how the, uh, the people got driven off the land. Israel had very well-armed uh, militias and paramilitary organizations, which became the Israeli military once uh, the state was declared. Uh, and they drove 750,000 Palestinians out of their homes and out of, out of, uh, you know, out of Palestine, basically, or in, into the West Bank and Gaza, but out of the, the you know, the main park. And uh, there were still half a million or so left behind, but um, that's how we got to the 1948 situation where, uh, Jordan was in control of the West Bank. Egypt had the, the Gaza Strip. And then all that changed in 67 when Israel goes to war against those countries and takes the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and the Sinai, which it gave back later on, and the Golan Heights from Syria. <laughs> anyway. they, they have that now, thank, thanks to Trump. So. Well, they've uh, annexed the Golan Heights. There's a de facto annexation, certainly, of the West Bank, which the Trump people seem fine are fine with. Uh, because the Trump people are all partisans of Israel. Uh, his brother, his son-in-law is, is, I think, the de facto godson of Netanyahu. He, he knew Netanyahu when he was growing up. His father was a friend of Netanyahu. Netanyahu used to stay at his house when he was a kid. He would give up his bedroom and sleep in the guest room so Netanyahu could have a better room. So I think Netanyahu is his, his de facto godfather, actually. Which is ironic because they're also super close with MBS going on his yacht and this and that. Yeah, so but Israel's I, close with them. But but Netanyahu's close with MBS. There's 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 a pretty open alliance now between Israel and Saudi Arabia, uh, because they have a common enemy in Iran and Saudi Arabia. A common enemy. It's not that I, I I use the word enemy. It's not as if Iran's really a threat to them. They're not. They don't have been. a nuclear weapon. They don't want a nuclear weapon. They never were making a nuclear weapon. There's plenty of them on the record. Read Gareth Ford's book, uh, Manufactured Crisis. Uh, they're the most unthreatening enemy you could you can imagine. Uh, and yet, they're convenient. And the Palestinians, you know, the you, you might say, well, but what about the Saudis and the Palestinians? You know, the Arab governments typically have not cared about the Palestinians. They've used the Palestinians when it was opportunistic, and their and their their public, their people may care about the Palestinians. So sometimes they have to sound like they're pro-Palestinian. So there's not, an, you know, kind of uprising or discontent in their own countries. But they don't care about the Palestinians. But they'll care about the displacement they of the they would rather Kurds. work with the Israelis. Uh, who? Who cares? <laughs> uh, I, right. No. No, but I mean, I mean, in the media, they'll have crocodile oh, tears for all sure. the Kurds and everything. But, you know, no one knows anything about the Palestinian crisis because that's not talked yeah. about. Where do you think, right. like, that mainstream narrative or brainwashing, like, really started? And, like, is it even able well, to, like, break through the cracks and have people actually learn about it and have them teach it without being called anti-Semites? Well, that's the tough part. Look, a lot of it is understandable. We already talked about Nazi Germany. Of course, people were feeling very bad and, you know, in some ways guilty, vicariously guilty, or, and, and certainly very sympathetic to Jews after uh, Nazi Germany, after the Holocaust uh, and, and that war ended. So you can see why there was an, a, a huge amount of understanding and sympathy. And a lot of people would have said, look, if they want to go to Palestine, then yeah, look, they should be able to go to Palestine. Uh, the fact is, most of them would have come to the U.S. if they had the chance. They want to go to Palestine. Who wants to go to live in the desert? They didn't want to go to live in the desert. Not that it was just desert, because the Palestinians had developed quite a bit of it. It was actually a vibrant place. Uh, but to, but these were Western Europeans. Why do they want to go to Palestine? 
you give them a ticket to New York, they're ha- going to be, they're going to want to come to New York. In fact, there's a line in, uh, I recently w- watched the movie Exodus, which came out in 1960, which all of us middle-class American Jewish kids were taken to see in 1960, because it's about the struggle to get Jews into Palestine in 1947-48 and get the, get a state created. And there's a young girl who's a, who's a survivor from Germany who's talking to uh, an American woman who's not Jewish who says, you know, I would, I would like to take you to America, like adopt her. I, I could bring you to America. And she said, um, oh, I'd, I'd love to go to America. We all would like to go to America. I mean, I can't believe that in that movie they have the survivors of, of the Holocaust saying, yeah, I'll go to, let's go to America, not Palestine. Take me to America. I'm, they, gave, they gave away something there. Uh, but I can see, I understand the sympathy. But on top of the sympathy, there's a lot of stuff that, that I don't have, that I don't have sympathy with. You mentioned the charge of anti-Semitism. Anybody that spoke up and said, well, wait a second, there are people living in Palestine who have been living there for millennia. They, why are they, they should just, you know, leave? Because the idea was, look, they're Arabs. What's the difference where they live in the Arab world? Pick them up and move them somewhere else. That's how people talk. Move them into Jordan. Move them into, you know, Iraq. You know, what's the difference? An Arab's an Arab. I mean, that was really the attitude. The Arabs were never consulted about anything. The British never consulted them about anything. The UN didn't consult them about partition. And they rejected the partition. And that was portrayed as being intransigent, which we still hear to this day, right? Oh, they're uncompromising. Well, come on. It was their, it's, it was their homes. And they lived there for centuries and centuries. And may well be the descendants of the Canaanites and the he- and Hebrews. Uh, the fact that they weren't willing to give up their part of their home doesn't make them intransigent. And yet that's how it was always portrayed. And Americans, Americans identified more with the, 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 the Jews of Palestine and then what became the state of Israel. They, they were more Western. They spoke English. A lot of them were educated in the West, unlike the Palestinians who seemed more foreign. And then as time went on, they got portrayed as uh, terrorists. And then, it, you know, uh, uh, but what's not known is that most Jews have been against the, the Zionist project. Uh, Nazi Germany, again, changed things, but for the longest time, Zionism was a minority movement within Judaism. And there's a long tradition, solid tradition of Jewish anti-Zionism, which I find in my, when I talk to people, they know very, they know nothing about it. They never heard of that. They just assumed all Jews were in favor of setting up the state of Israel when Peter Herzl announced his intention in, uh, you know, 1896. So what, what can people do? I mean, we, we can't really change it. And a two-state right. solution is just a useful excuse for the continuation because they're a majority, and if they had the rights to vote, then they'd outnumber the Jews that are there. So, I mean, like, what can people do? I mean, can we just be mad about it and preach it? or? Well, at least get clear on the injustice that's going on. Because a lot of people find it very easy to say, look, this is an ancient conflict, and it's very complicated, and therefore, I can't figure it out. And both of those things are wrong. It's not an ancient conflict. I think what I've said already tonight should make that clear. It's not an ancient conflict. It's about a 100-year-old conflict, a little more. And, and it's not that complicated. When you think about it, it's really property not, rights. This it's property right. This is not a religious war, so you can't say a lot. You know, a lot of libertarians are secular or atheists and say, ah, that's just two religious factions fighting. You know, irrational. What do you expect? Don't expect me to figure it out because it's just two. You know, competing superstitions. I mean, that's wrong. Uh, to be fair, religious, that, that's what Ronald not, Reagan actually argued when he was supporting <laughs> the uprising in Southern in uh, Lebanon because in he Lebanon. said, this is too complicated to understand. We shouldn't be here in the first place. Right. Which no, is ironic. these things are not ancient. These things, I mean, there are some old sectarian rivalries in different parts of the world, but this is not one of them. This is, this is fairly recent, of recent vintage, you know, late 19th century, really. Uh, and it's not religious. It's about real estate and it's about property rights. 
Uh, and the, I don't know. It's funny how the left, when the left champions the Palestinians, I don't think they they don't. When I say the left, I mean sort of the anti-private property left, right? They don't seem to realize they're arguing a property rights story. They don't get that. They'll talk about you know the national rights of the Palestinians, but it's not about national rights. It's not about group rights. It's about the right. There are the Palestinians in refugee camps and in Gaza, which is basically an open air prison, who have deeds and keys in their pockets from homes they were driven out of or their parents were driven out of in 1947-1948 because 750,000 people got driven out of their homes and half of the Palestinian villages were paved over and turned into Jewish villages and wiped off the map. Uh, we never hear about that, but that's what happened in order to establish the, uh, you know, the so-called Jewish state. And I say so-called Jewish state because it's because it's not a religious state. I mean, the religious parties have some influence, but it's not a religious state. It's a, it's sort of an ethnocracy. Ethno, it's an ethno state, uh, except it's a false eth ethnicity because there's not a Jewish ethnicity. Judaism is a religion. It's not an ethnic group. How can it be an ethnic group if there's if there's Jews in every ethnic group you can name? And there are all around the world, right? There are black Af black Africans who are Jewish. There are Yemen Yemenis who are Jewish. There are Iranians that are Jewish. They don't share ethnicity. They have different cultures, different languages, different foods, different theater. They're not the same people. It's not one people. So in what sense is it a Jewish state? That's, that's a very good question. Uh, Jewish scientists are looking for a Jew, the Jewish gene, but they're not going to find it. There is no Jewish gene. <laughs> I mean, in, fact, they're, in effect, they're giving the Nazis and the anti-Semites a victory, right? They're saying, yes, you're right. After all, we are totally different. We're alien in any place but our own homeland. So, yeah, you should throw us out. I mean, that's kind of what they're saying. Yeah, what are they going to do next? Are, are they going to bring back out those measuring utensils and measure their face like they did? We found well, the gene. They're, look, they're looking for the traits, but they're now looking because we know about the, the genome and the DNA. That's where they're looking, the DNA. But the evidence is mounting, and I know uh, one person, a researcher in this area, Who's, uh, who's actually comparing the DNA of uh, Ashkenazi Jews, European Jews and American Jews who came from Europe, with the bones, the DNA from ancient bones. And they don't resemble, the, the Ashkenazi Jews don't resemble the people from the Middle East. They resemble people from around the Black Sea, Eastern Turkey, Western Iran, uh, that area around the Caucasus, Caucasus Mountains you know, uh, around the, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, near the Republic of Georgia, you know. That was a major empire that had converted. So like I said, it gets back to this uh, convert. Uh, I mean, the chances are my, my, uh, uh, my ancestors came from uh, the kingdom of Khazaria or somewhere in that neighborhood, possibly Kiev, someplace like that. Not from Palestine, not from Canaan. <laughs> So I guess friendly debate and uh, just peaceful discussions were the only way through this, if at all. Well, you asked what we could do. Look, it's not really my place to say whether there should be one state or two states. People actually now need to sit down. But the, the Israelis need to understand that they need to apologize to the Palestinians, then sit down in good faith and really talk. They don't talk in good faith now. They always make the Palestinians look like they're the, un the ones that will compromise. And anytime Israel makes some cosmetic change in its base demand, that's seen as super generous, right? And the New York Times will say, oh, the generous offer by the, by the Israeli negotiators, you know, turned down by the Palestinians. Because the Palestinians have, have never even been offered uh, uh, their own state in, in, you know, uh, in all these talks that have gone on since 1967. And now it's a two-state solution may be gone because Israel controls so much of the uh, of the West Bank uh, with roads and a wall, and they you know settlements they put in there uh, that it's uh, it'd be hard to see how that would even work. But here's the thing: is look, we can't ignore realities. Israel is is uh, what over 70 years old, right? Starting from 1948, May 1948, it. It is a, it, it is, it has a culture. In that time, the people who live there 
have formed a culture, not a Jewish culture. There's no Jewish culture, like I just said. There's no Jewish ethic. But there is an Israeli culture. They have a language. They have food. They have, they have music. They have a, a theater. They have all the things that, are, that, that people form. And while in this day of mass communications and the Internet trade and everything, no culture is, is really isolated, and all cultures are a mixture of you know, things from all over the world, there is an identifiable Israeli culture. And, and, and so the, the idea is what's the best way for all the people there and, not, and let's, not, let's, let's not leave out the refugees, uh, the Palestinian refugees who got driven out who, who still have property that they have a claim, proper claim to. How can all those people live together? If they would all just sit down in good faith, they could work that out in some sort of liberal, secular, you know, quote, democratic, I mean, as a libertarian, we know the problems with democracy. But, you know, when people say, are you for one state or two states, I say, well, look, I'm, I'm actually for a no state solution. <laughs> but that's not, unfortunately, on the menu today. Uh, so the question is, what's, what's more feasible? A two state where the Israelis actually withdraw from the West Bank and from Gaza, or one state where there's one secular, you know, democratic state, hopefully with a very, very limited government. Uh, that's not for me to settle. But the first step is Israel to Israel has to acknowledge that the, the Palestinians are the agreed party. And the question is, you know, what are the chances they're, they're going to do that? I mean, Israel is a very hardened society now. It's a, it's a, I think it's a largely racist society. I think they want the Arabs, they would like the Arabs to leave if they could get them out or they could transfer them and get away with it. I think they'd be very happy to do it. I'm not saying every Israeli. But I think that's the dominant view. You know, no major Israeli party will have an Arab in, in its coalition. You see what they're doing now in Israel. They're fighting over who's going to be the, the next uh, governing uh, bloc and the next uh, prime minister. And they all say, even though the, the Arab bloc scored third in the elections, it's like the third largest party, the, the two other ones say, don't worry, no Arab will be in our government. Don't worry about it. Uh, they're only, you know, they're 20% of the population the Arabs, divided between Muslims and Christians, but they're second class or, or worse citizens. I'm talking about in Israel now, not the territories. They don't have the same rights as Israelis. They don't have the same access to, as Jewish Israelis. They're citizens. They're citizens, but they're not nationals. Because what matters in Israel is not citizenship, but nationality. And if you're an Israeli citizen, that doesn't mean you're, you're, not, a, you're not an Israeli national, because there's no such thing. The nationalities within Israel are Jew, Arab, Druze, you know, and then a whole bunch of other names that refer to smaller communities, Circassians, you know, other, other groups. But what counts is not whether you're an Israeli citizen, because if you're an Israeli citizen but an Arab national, you do not have the same rights or access to resources and land. That's what shows time. up on your driver's license. Yeah, I think the law changed. I don't think it's on the license anymore, but it is in your records. It's the only country, certainly the only modern advanced country that distinguishes nationality from citizenship. And I, you know, I could go tomorrow, fly there, and within a very short time become a citizen because I'm already regarded, I'd already be regarded as a national, despite the fact that I don't believe in God <laughs> and I don't practice the religion. But they would still, unless my politics get me out, that could happen, uh, I could become a citizen right away. And yet, this, the, the child or grandchild of, a, uh, of an Arab who was run out of his home in Israel, in Palestine, in 1948 by the, uh, you know, by the Haganah, the future Israeli Defense Force, and who has a key in his pocket for the house, because the house probably been long demolished, he can't go back and, and live there. But I could go tomorrow. I wasn't born there. I visited it once, twice in the 70s, but I haven't been back. I have no intention of going. But I could become a citizen tomorrow. You know, it's funny you say that because I might be able to as well. I'm not Jewish, <laughs> but occasionally, I, this has happened three times. I've gotten text messages saying, hi, this is Ravi. Are you ready for your birthright citizen trip to Israel? I'm like, oh. mm, interesting. Well, maybe I got a shot. Who knows? Not that well, I would go. That's interesting because I thought that's a part of They must think you're, or they've done some genetic research on you. Uh, research. <laughs> I, I gave Google my spit and 23andMe said I'm nothing Jewish at all. 
I'm like some dark, dark, dark spot in Italy, and that's as like ethnic as I get. And then the rest is all Britain. And well, there were France and there were white. converts. There were converts in Italy in the you know in the early early times during well, the Roman I, Empire. There, there well, I could be a convert here. God damn it, right? <laughs> maybe you're the child of a convert, and it wouldn't show up in your DNA. Who knows? <laughs> uh Sheldon I've, I've kept you a little over the expected time so I just really want to thank you up and down for coming on the show and really well, I haven't rambled too much but I enjoyed it no it was perfect I could uh I could get another hour but I don't think either of us have the stamina of Scott Horton <laughs> not this so. hour yeah this is past my bedtime yeah <laughs> well awesome <laughs> uh thank you sir what are you up to do you have any uh upcoming plans other than the book and if not just plug absolutely everything you'd like to I write occasionally at the Libertarian Institute. I've had articles the last two weeks there on Fridays and uh, promoting the book. These days I'm just promoting the book. And uh, yeah, nothing uh, nothing too big at the moment between things. Well, you are a very eclectic man. You write about everything. So um, I will love, and I'm sure the audience will love to have you come talk about uh, smoking pipes and how it's a hobby, not sure. a habit. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hobby, not a, a habit. Hobby, not a habit. Yeah. There we uh, go. Sure. I'd be happy to. We can, talk, we can bring in the whole vaping scare, which is phone, phone use. Oh, my uh, goodness. I've been postponing an, an article because just development's coming up, and it's it's silly. It's just, uh, you yeah. know, why not get rid of everything else? But, you know, the, the state's going to do status things. So, you know, we're, we're just here. Right. we got to make do. States will be states. <laughs> awesome. States got to stay. States got to stay. States All right. Stay. Thank you, sir. I enjoyed it. Road to